In this video, we're going to go over eight weird statements by fundamentalist preachers. If you like this video, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification button. Warning, this channel may cause you to think independently, understand bad religion when you see it, and protect you from wasting your time in dysfunctional churches. Hi, I'm Renee, and this is me in the 1980s, saved and sanctified. Yeah, that was a term we used in our testimonies to let everybody know we were measured up. At 19, I joined a group that called themselves the Church of God. We felt our doctrine was perfect, and we were on our way to heaven if we followed our pastor's rules. All seemed right until I became a minister and saw how much my church played pretend. I began to study what was inherently wrong in our church and why this religion inflicted so many emotional scars on my family and others. Serving God is supposed to make us better, not worse. I couldn't believe that I dedicated my life to a system that had made so many grave errors in people's lives. Now, my family is free and healing after leaving this system and life is better. Follow me as I show you the problems with extreme religion and what you can do to recover and why you should simply stay away. Welcome to The Changing Room. After 30 years of being in a fundamentalist authoritarian church and part of it spent as an ordained minister, these are the freakiest encounters I have had with preachers and its insight into the weird and shocking psyche involved in extreme religion. Number eight, the reason God wants me to preach this morning, there's a visitor here that's never heard me preach. This was the reason a preacher gave to me as to why he should probably preach a particular morning, implying that he was just that good. Or maybe he felt that people needed to hear a man preacher and not a weekly woman. We had a visitor that morning from another church, a visitor in fact that was a pastor and decided to visit our church. In our group, that was an opportunity to show the power of God and get this preacher on the right path to hear the truth. However, our pastor was not available that morning and had asked me to preach as the more experienced minister available. This was met with protest from the male preacher who demanded to be given the pulpit in the pastor's absence. I explained that the pastor already had settled this issue, but nothing doing. In his estimation, this needed to be opened back up for discussion. Needless to say, I refused this last minute foolery. The female minister who was with us in the prayer room followed along with this nonsense. So I was left to simply stand my ground. Whatever the reason, the pastor congratulated me for standing my ground later, but then he still couldn't bring himself to correct a younger male minister. Number seven, you've been making faces at me. This was said to me by one of my pastors who called together the entire ministry to correct me through a series of meetings meant to harass me because I was quote unquote disrespectful. In this meeting, he could not think of anything I had done as disrespectful. I asked him to name a time that he could think of where I had been disrespectful. And he claimed that yours truly had been making faces at him. When I asked what kind of faces, because as a person, I'm not very facially expressive, he mugged an imitation of what he thought he saw. And I thought, where are we? In kindergarten? And he proceeded to continue to have these meetings while the other ministers knew nothing about this ridiculous reason that he called me disrespectful. This had to be one of the weirdest moments in my religious life. Number six, did you know that the Jews are responsible for all of the world's financial problems? Here, let me send you the website. 
Uh, no, don't bother because I can imagine it's a Nazi hate filled website. That was how I felt. But at the last minute I said, well, yeah, send it to me. I thought to myself, I want to know what kind of mess you're reading. I do not remember this horrible website and nor would I share it if I did. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon in these authoritarian churches where preachers have way too much power for some of them to find more crazy ideas that they feel will make them unique from the rest of the world and more crazy ideas they can impose on their followers. In fact, many of these preachers of love and Christian unity do not even believe in interracial marriage, not realizing that a loving God cares nothing about the amount of melanin in your skin or the lack thereof. Number five, women get raped because of the clothes they wear. It never failed that men in these groups who tend to over-sexualize everything felt that a woman's clothing made it impossible for a man to keep his junk to himself. This was actually preached from the pulpit many times. And because we women in these churches are often under the same spell, none of us protested. In fact, women in these groups tend to often turn to their sisters and find ways to shame them about their bodies even more, especially if some were more shapely than others. Many of the women actually believed this because it came from the man of God. In fact, Victim blaming is still a problem in our society, but in authoritarian churches, the blaming is doubled. Women's bodies are a problem. It's a problem not for the men to solve, but for the women to solve by making themselves as unappealing as possible. Number four, if a man begins to get aroused, or begin the act of sex, it's impossible for him to stop. At that point, it's not rape, it's just nature. Well, thanks for helping me see how you justified your last sexual encounter. One time, I was in a room full of ministers when this was said. I protested and even told them, look, rape is not a lust issue. It's an act of violation, hatred, and violence. How do you think 80-year-old grandmothers get raped during break-ins or little girls get attacked by their male relatives? What was their crime? What were they doing to entice these people? This started ignorant protest from the group. Mind you, many of the men in the room were college graduates. I'm telling you, education has nothing to do with ignorance. So don't be surprised that educated people believe crazy stuff. One of them asked me, how do you know? How do you know what's on the rapist's mind? I think this is common knowledge among people that study criminals, I said. I turned around and I looked for help from the female ministers in the room, but they refused to engage in the conversation. Now, this was not unusual in these male-dominated churches for women not to defend themselves or other women. And this is just indicative of some of the crazy sexual beliefs that happen in authoritarian churches. Number three, we should have holy hands, holy hair, and holy feet. The women in our group were often warned against prostitute or hooker shoes, meaning open-toed, lots of straps, painted toenails, and the whole look of the foot had to be a certain way. Or we had to be careful of things that might cause a person with a foot fetish to fall away from God. You would think we were a cult of recovered foot fetishists. The holy hair thing was to keep women from getting hairstyles the group considered worldly. The holy hands was apparently a thing thrown in to round things out like head, shoulders, knees, and toes. You know the kid's song, <laughs> heads and shoulders, knees and toes. You know, just to round things out because why? Number two. Women's breasts are for babies only and not for any pleasure. This was stated in the book of Dumbo chapter zero because why would you even need to feel that you could preach something like this to adults who have sex? Okay, now that we know what goes on in your bedroom, 
please refrain from preaching this insanity. I guess the passion that's described in the Song of Solomon should be ripped out of the Bible. Seriously though, scientifically speaking, oxytocin is a hormone secreted during breast stimulation. It helps mothers bond with their children during breastfeeding. It actually facilitates the desire to cuddle and feel connected to your partner before and after sex. In other words, stimulation of the breast before, during, and after is just natural and pleasurable for everyone concerned. Number one, I don't know why God blessed me with two virgins. Again, over-sexualizing just about everything, this was said from the pulpit one time in reference to the fact that this particular man was for a second time getting blessed with a wife. His first wife was a virgin and his second wife, he stated, was a virgin, as far as he knew. So I imagine the virginity was at the top of the list of qualification for a wife for him. This was said in reference to both women's sexual status over the pulpit. This same preacher spoke from the pulpit about non-virgins being used goods. Again, as often happens in these groups, because a man of God said something under the anointing, the women in the congregation took up this cause by separating the single women into the touched and the untouched, at least that we know of. Now, somewhere in this was an odd belief that virgins were a sign of favor from God. Now, this is very similar to the Muslim belief that having virgins in heaven is a sign of God's favor. Apparently, that's heaven, having virgins. This, of course, is definitely not a Christian thing, but the preacher made it sound like if you're lucky enough to get a virgin, well, just rub your lucky virgin and you'll get what you want. You'll get all three wishes because we're all forgiven of all of our sins and are clean in God's eyes. Possibly this man's belief is from the Old Testament value placed on virginity in ancient Israel but it's more likely he was celebrating that he would be the first to get there twice. Never mind that we are past the year 2000. And to some people, virginity is idolized and a prize, but only for girls and not boys. Mm -hmm.